Today we're here in Germany visiting Magura, the iconic brake manufacturer. Now they actually produce everything right here in Germany at three different locations, located actually all between them less than 10 kilometers apart. And we're going to go to each of them and we're going to check out everything from R&D through to carbon composites and the way they make that stuff, all the way through to auto bleeding, which we're going to see in this one on the production line. This is going to be a tech overload. Come with me. Now I'm super excited to be here because Magura has a rich history in mountain biking. In fact, Magura brake levers were spec'd on the first ever commercially available bike, a Gary Fisher mountain bike no less, uh, and it was in fact Magura that extended him credit to enable him to spec bikes and get the scene going. This company has been in it from the beginning. Let's get inside, shall we? And what they've really been known for over the years in mountain biking is their hydraulic brakes. Uh, we started with the Hydrostop hydraulic rim brakes. So it's a closed system that offered power unlike anything we'd ever seen before in mountain biking. Now, they finally released a race line model, which was bright and like, neon yellow. Uh, and when they did that, there was a sea of yellow that appeared overnight. And actually, Bart Brentjens really made the brake quite famous by winning the first mountain bike appearance at the Olympics at Atlanta in 1996. And if you skip forward to modern day, Loic Bruni has just won the current World Championships in downhill, also using Magura brakes. But it's not just about speed. The gravity riders and the technical riders that have favored them for so long are now taking their brakes to big mountain. You've only got to look at what Danny McCaskill's done on the slabs to understand that he is accepting the power and the trust in a brake like that. Okay, enough waffle for me and the history. Let's find out a bit about what goes on in this particular building and the other buildings located here in town. So this is the main R&D facility and headquarters located in Bad Urach. Um, and actually the company name takes itself uh, from here and the founder, Gustav Magenworth. Uh, now he founded the company in 1893 and the Mag from his surname and the Ura from the location became Magura. And they actually named their first proper mountain bike disc brake after Gustav, the Gustav M, which was from 1996. Uh, the one I'm more familiar with is that one in the race line yellow, uh, the downhill brake with the floating caliper, so ahead of its time. Really cool stuff to see. And everywhere you look through the company, there's just the history on the walls of things they've been involved in. So something you have to bear in mind is this company makes motorcycle stuff as well as bicycle stuff, really quite unique. And there's three locations here in Germany. And of course, there's also a CNC machining facility in Nuremberg. There's another location in Portugal. And as you can see, a few more global locations in particular in Asia and of course in the USA. I do like a challenge. <laughs> Let's go see what we can see. The main headquarters at Bad Urek handles everything from company operations all the way through to the more interesting side of things from my perspective, uh, which is the R&D facility. Now in here, everything happens from prototyping to design and concept. Uh, you see lots of industrial design happening on software like SolidWorks. And we got to see some really cool stuff. But also, they've got an archive up in the loft, which we were really lucky to go and see. Uh, to say it's a bit of an archive is a slight understatement. They were just there's thousands of products in here that I, I don't even know what half of them are. There's pumps, there's brake levers, there's clutch assemblies. Uh, everywhere you look, there's something different. There's handlebar grips from, uh, from across the motorbike world. There's, just look at some of this stuff. It's got the dust on it. It's got all the dates of every single product. If you just come down here, I was just looking at some of the stuff in here. I'll just put my camera down. Have a look at this brake lever here. So that one is from, that was from 79. Uh, that's the year I was born, that's pretty old. Um, with a Magura grip on there as well. And check this out, this is a fuel pump from a Volkswagen Beetle dating back to 1961. I mean, the stuff that this company's worked on is, is frankly astounding. Okay, well that's a pretty cool look around at this facility. I'm dead keen though to have a look at how the composites come together because that is something they do right here in town. Onwards. Thank you. 
OK, so of the three facilities, this is the one that specialises in the composites. OK, so as you may know already, you've got a carbo texture for the actual major part of the brake levers. And one of the coolest things about the entire production here at Magura in Germany is that almost every part is done here. It all starts right here with the raw material that comes in. So you've got this raw material, as you can see, so you've got the, especially this turns into the thermoplastic that's used in the injection mouldings. And this has actually got carbon within it. This is what gives the brakes their structure. Now they choose this material because it's about 50% the weight of aluminium, but actually the same strength. Now the bags behind me have the raw material that come in. They go for about a ton of that a day, and it's about 55 tons of that a month that they use. Now that raw material is piped upstairs up to the hoppers, which we're just about to see, and then into these big pipes here where it's dried. So follow me upstairs. You gotta love this stuff in factories when, uh, when a factory's willing to open its doors. Also note how clean it is here. So up here, this is super cool. You've got a whole whirlwind of things. So that raw material is pumped up into these tubes. And you'll probably see some going on in the background. Now the curves here are made from glass. Now, yes, that's cool because you can see what's going on, but it's made from glass because it's so smooth on the inside that you can't get that with alloy tubing. So the material doesn't stick on the insides. And it goes into this whirlwind of the tubing, as you can see above me here. I mean, so hectic, I love this stuff follows through and on the big pipes on the back wall and then it goes into the hoppers and into each individual machine. Now if you look over my shoulder here you'll see how few people there are actually working here and how many machines there are. Everything about this company is about efficiency. Using products made locally, making brakes completely in these facilities. Absolutely amazing. So all the piping in the hot tubes as you've seen up here, they're piping the bits along and they come into another hopper here where it's further dried before it gets pushed into the machine. Now what you can't see behind here is there's a giant screw. Uh, we're gonna be able to see one, they've got one hanging on the wall over there as part of the tooling to give you an idea how the injection molding works. And essentially, as this stuff drops down onto the screw, there's a heating element in there and everything is heated up and by the time it gets to the end of the screw, the thread on it turns from a thick thread to a very fine thread and then it's pushed straight into the mold there and that's when it's put under immense pressure. When it comes out of the mold, you'll be able to see, just coming past any second now, completely finished brake master cylinders. Now these ones are for MT5s, obviously there's different brakes in the series. They're just dropping down now and we're gonna take one off the production line here to have a look at. And what you don't understand is just how cool this process is. There's zero waste, it's really efficient and it's so efficient, in fact, if I take this one off here, it's still warm, and you have a close in on it, you can see just how well finished it is. So you've got the threads there for the bleed port, you've got where the piston goes in, you've got where the hose goes in with the barb and the fitting on the end. It's finished and ready for use. There's no other finishing that's necessary. If that was made from a different material, perhaps aluminium, it might need some additional finishing, like anodizing or facing or whatever, to get it done. The point is, that is ready for use. And in fact, we're gonna take this one with us on a little journey, and we're gonna see it, because we've seen the raw material in, you've seen it turn into this, and then we're gonna see this turn into a working brake. How cool is that? But in the meantime, let's zip next door, because I've seen another brake that I have to reference. It's just coming out of the mold completely differently. So I've just noticed this is from one of the new ABS levers. So as you can see, the actual master on here is quite a lot bigger because it carries a lot more fluid. If you look closely in here, you can see it's bored out. It's quite a bit bigger as well. So your regular piston is a 10 mil. This takes a 12 mil piston. So it's pushing a lot more fluid down that line there. Uh, just mega cool to see because that's what I rode with Steve Jones from EMBM. And that is the future. You watch. And for nostalgic reasons, I just wanted to pick up on this as well. This is one of the mounting parts for the HS site, so the hydrostop brakes, basically the rim brakes. It's so hot, I could barely touch it, to be honest. Uh, but very cool to see that. It takes me down memory lane. I'm so pleased they're still producing them. So these machines are running literally every day of the year. Uh, as you can see, in this particular basket behind me, we've got 236 pieces. That's just part of an HS system. And you think how many different things are going on at once. Now, apparently, it's just half a day a year the machines don't work on Christmas Eve. Okay, onwards into the next part. 
So as part of the injection molding process, you've got to also bear in mind that everything has to be uh, constantly maintained, stripped down, rebuilt, uh, completely routine. Uh, we've seen part of that process already in another room. And here's some of these molding machines uh, that have to be maintained. So you bear in mind that some of these have 1,000 bar running through these in order to do that sort of compression of the injection molding system there. And a super hot liquid plastic, basically, that goes through these things. Uh, so as a result of that, at some point after an amount of uh, production line systems there, you're going to have some of the systems clog up on the inside. So everything has to be absolutely meticulously maintained. Uh, it's, it's just quite overwhelming. Uh, let's move on a bit. So another injection molding machine here, this time making seals. Now the coolest thing about this is there's a tiny little air jet that sprays anodized air onto these little seals because they're so small, when they're hot, they don't come off the molding machine properly. So it cools them down, so as it flips up onto its end, it can drop them off perfectly on the little convoy belt. And they'll come along here and into this little basket. As you can see here, we've got these tiny little seals. Literally everything done in-house here. Absolutely amazing to see. So cool. Definitely a bit of a back to school day today, seeing things like this on the wall. Principle of an injection molding machine. As you can see, that's where sort of the granulate comes into the hopper there, and it's dropped down onto the screw itself where it's heated up. And look at the difference in the bore on the screw, the way it changes. So it's quite coarse at the top here, where the material itself is cooler. As it turns into liquid at the end, it's much finer. And of course, then it's pushed all the way into the actual mold. And that's, of course, where the pressure is applied. Love seeing stuff like this. Really, really cool. So as part of the carbon texture system, you need dedicated hardware. And what you can see popping out in here is thousands of bleed screws. Uh, so we've got our little MT5 unit here that we're going to take with us on the travels. And there's one of the little bleed screws you can see here. If you don't want to be using like metal hardware, you need to use carbon texture with carbon texture to achieve the correct sealing and the correct properties they need from the brake. Now, something that's often misunderstood about this it's almost no torque is needed to close it. It's not like using like a metal screw. Uh, barely any torque to close it, makes a proper seal. Uh, really cool to see it. And also, absolutely tiny little seals popping out in there as well. I didn't think we were gonna see things as small as that from production like this. That's ace. Now this is just a storage solution for some of the tooling here. Now there's 21 trays available up here and each one of them can carry up to 715 kilograms of these things. And the trays go all the way that way and all the way that way. Um, it just tells you a lot about how many of these are in use the whole time and also the amount that are being maintained, which you've already seen, and these ones here which are ready to be used again. So they'll go up, they'll whiz up to the top, another tray will come down, they'll get used, they'll get cleaned, they'll get prepped and so forth. Such an efficient system in this whole place. So clean and just so few staff, which I think that's quite telling, actually. Um, sign of the times, producing things like that. Very cool. And we're just on our way out of the carbon texture facility here. Uh, and I've just noticed this display feature clearly made for a, I don't know, a show of some kind. And you look at it and you think, well, this can't possibly be made of carbon texture, but it is. It looks like it's made from metal. And the same with this. So these are actually components for wheelchairs. Uh, so it's essentially the fork for a wheelchair to hold the wheel there. You can, I guess, adjust the rake or use different wheel sizes. Uh, you can also see brake levers here. You can see uh, throttles from motorbikes. And down the bottom here, you can see some things that are a bit more familiar, sort of brake lever masters, and actually the brake pads, the little holders there that are actually made using the same process. So they actually make a lot of components from the same manufacturing process. Okay, so let's find out where this piece of carbon texture magic turns into a set of brakes. Now, in this facility, you have to wear one of their blue jackets because it's all about cleanliness in here. Or maybe they just want to make it look like at work here. Hmm. Well, anyway, there's the classic logo. As you can see that on the floor, resembles a steering rack, as well as an M, classic. And let's go in. Okay, welcome to Magura's production facility. Now this is where all of the brake levers are actually assembled. So what we're going to see in a minute is the sort of the giant inbox of the building where all the components are shipped into one place. I think I'm just going to take a little walk through this aisle here and just have a look and see what we can see. As you can see, you've got all of these machines everywhere and each one of them is responsible for doing all sorts of cool things. Just along the way here, you're going to see 
all the screws being put into the actual brake lever bodies themselves, the clamps being put into the bodies, all this sort of stuff. But the key thing about this is it's not possible without the staff to do it. So whereas the car architecture stuff was largely machines doing their own thing, you need the staff here to load the machines up. So yeah, it's a very tech process, but you still need the people. And I like that. Okay, so we have our lever body and this room right here. Thinking this is a giant inbox. This is where all the rest of the components come into this particular facility. Now you notice you'll see a variety of different colored boxes and things around here. What actually happens in this part is they all end up in these massive blue crates of which there are, there's miles of these things. And the reason I have to get in a blue crate is so that they know everything has basically not gonna bring any contamination into the facility. It's the same reason we're wearing blue jackets. It's the same reason all the staff wear very specific clothing. Each one of the crates is completely loaded with the components to build these brakes and all the other brakes they sell. And of course, everything is scanned in and out. So they know when something's empty, it's already ordering more to come straight back in and replenish those supplies. Now, this is how seriously they take the contamination of things in this building. They even have a giant washing machine here to actually wash these crates. Now this machine, they were saying, washes 21 of these at a time in here. And then they go straight back to the beginning again, ready to be filled up with more components to build these. That's pretty wild. A few cool little random things in here. They've got shop floor management, which is the sort of thing you see in massive factories. And you've also got these little uh, traffic light systems. So visually people know if that one's good to go or if that one means it needs more work doing on it. Pretty simple stuff. But actually when it comes to factories and the way they work, visual stuff is so, so important. Each one of these contains a thousand liters of royal blood. That is the mineral oil that Maguri used to bleed their brakes exclusively. One of those only lasts a week in this place. <laughs> thousand liters in brakes, wow. So as you may or may not know, uh, the Magura system actually has a flip-flop lever, which means you can use the right or the left either way around uh, without having to take the hoses from the levers. As part of that, you have a bleed port on both sides, which is super handy. But the actual master cap on there, you don't need to remove it like you do with some other brakes. So what happens is the little rubber diaphragm that goes over the top is put in place here, and then the cap is actually compressed into place and clicked down by this little press fit machine here. That never needs to come off the lever, so that is installed permanently at this phase here, which you can see going on in the background. Then you've got a little bit more assembly going on here. You have the lever clamp that goes in place, and the clamp, as you know, has two bolts holding it on. One of the bolts will be closed, the other one will be open, meaning when you go to fit the brake, you slide it onto handlebars and you just need to close the single one, so no overly complicated stage there. And then in the background here, you can see the springs being fitted into the levers. You can also see the pins being fitted as well. There's a whole number of stages. This is where it all comes together. A part of the customization program as well, uh, we've done a video on GMBN Tech before, all about customization. You can pick the little cylinder caps that go on the actual pistons there. You've got the little ID tag stickers and decals that go onto the actual lever tops. Uh, part of the customization program. The idea is the consumer can pick anything they want and have it how it is. Uh, and this all happens here by hand. That's pretty crazy. Okay, the machine behind me, I'm not actually allowed to show you up close because it does a whole bunch of things all at once. Uh, it's definitely the coolest thing I've ever seen. It's got probably 10 different things all going on at once in there. So the levers, complete with the line and the caliper, go straight into the machine and get loaded in, and then get filled up automatically. It has the bleed screw put in place. They're bled through completely to make sure there's no air in the system. Then they're tested. They're, they're basically every stage of it is done on this machine here. They test the lever for lever travel. Uh, they measure how far it is towards the bar, how far the piston has pushed that lever travel as well. And then it has a laser marking as well on there. So every stage for the production, they know every single one of these has been tested for consistency. So should there ever be a problem later down the line, they can trace it back to each particular line here to see where the problem might have happened. But looking at the way the machine operates, it's, it's unbelievable. Very cool. I can see why they don't want us to film it. Well, there we go, that is an empty brake straight off the production line. So that very last stage there we've seen, we've seen everything going on with the filling and the testing of the lines to make sure they're fully bled. And we've just seen on the machine behind us, having the hardware put in, having the brake pads, all that stuff put in place and the pad spacers, and they're wrapped up here. Now, what I didn't really realize was just how many parts go into making one of these brakes. There's approximately 90, that's nine zero parts in one of these brakes. And also, a massive thing to underline is, yeah, they've got all these automated machines to do this stuff. It's not possible without all these people that are so meticulous in the way that they work. 
Well, that kind of brings us up to where we are now. But where are we going next? What's coming next in the future? Let's go to another place and find out, shall we? So I think you're gonna see a little taste of the future right here, actually. So step inside, uh, it's just part of the R&D facility, they've got lots of stuff hanging around. And you know, right now, what we're seeing here with Magura is quite unique in terms of the brake development in the mountain bike world, because unlike any other brake manufacturer that also make components of things, Magura actually makes between the motorcycle world and obviously the bicycle world. So it positions them completely uniquely in terms of what they can offer. I mean, look, for example, you've got full mineral brakes, you've got a split here, and you've got a bike here, a motorcycle obviously with a dot lever on the front, and it's got a mineral operated clutch. But it's what's happening in town centers and city centers that's actually gonna dictate where the future starts lying with technology development. Obviously cars are being pushed out, hybrids and e-cars are being developed, but also you're getting other solutions that are actually coming in. And these are starting to take technology from both parts of the industry. The front brake on this one currently is actually a dot operated motorcycle unit here. The rear brake is actually much more like what we're used to seeing in the mountain bike world, which is a mineral operated lever. The mineral operated lever has a splitter at the back. And of course, being more like a bicycle in the way that you would maintain this and ride it, it's gonna favor it in terms of maintenance over the dot star systems that you have to replace the fluid annually on them, of course, to avoid any issues. But then moving over to the cargo system like you have here, these are far more, uh, you see a lot more of these in, in the UK and you're starting to see these everywhere. You see small businesses using these, maybe bakeries, delivery services, things like that. And of course, families taking kids to school and using them as passenger bikes. Now it's the technology on these that I think really does excite me. You've got ABS brakes on these now. Now I think in the past, ABS brakes on bikes were seen as, as a bit like, I don't need to use those. But let's just think about how these are being used. You've got the long wheel base, the front wheel all the way out the front there. You're dealing with wet tarmac and stuff. And it's this development that's led to what I think is the most exciting thing, ABS brakes on mountain bikes. Now, currently you can only have ABS brakes on an e-bike like this, uh, partly because it's uh, the way the whole system is developed, but also because it's a conjunction between Bosch and Magura at this stage. So you've got Magura providing the hydraulics, they're doing the brake levers, and they're doing the actual calipers and the disc rotors with the tone tracks on them. And then it's Bosch that make the intelligent system that join it together with the battery for the power there. Now, it's actually quite a remarkable system. And in ABS terms, you're gonna get active systems that use a pump and passive systems like this that in my opinion, actually looks quite a bit neater because of the fact you have a lever that's got more mechanical advantage on it because it's pushing more fluid down the line. So you've got a 12 mil piston over a regular 10 mil that we're used to seeing, pushes more. So you'd think your hands have to work harder, but they've reconfigurated the lever on these MTCs to give you the exact same feel that you would have on normal brakes, except for the fact you have the benefits of it being ABS. Now, yeah, I do think that you're gonna see this technology coming to mountain bikes in future, but, it's gonna to have to be completely set in the e-bike world first, because that's where all that exciting development is starting to happen in mountain biking. And if you think about what this company line stands for, it's innovation and design that's made here, right here in Germany, I'm really excited to see what's gonna happen, because actually I don't think anyone is operating quite like Magura at the moment. A fairly small family-run German business making incredible technology like this, and I'm really excited to see what the future is gonna be. Now, I've had a great trip here to Magura to find out how they make brakes and look at a little bit of where we're gonna be going with the future. I'd love to know what you think is gonna happen with the future of brakes on mountain bikes. Uh, let us know in the comments down there and we'll see you in another video soon. Take care.